right, I'm, I'm trusting that I am now live and that uh, I've got it all figured out. I appreciate so much uh, Brother Mark Howe, our uh, director. He's worked with a fellow that's kind of a, a Neanderthal when it comes to these type things, and uh, he's worked hard to keep us connected and so forth, but uh, just some things that I'm trying to work through and learn out uh, as I go along. So I appreciate what Brother Mark has done. He has spent a great deal of time uh, at home and here at the church trying to make sure that uh, we stream in the best possible way. I trust that you'll enjoy tonight's uh, broadcast and that you're able to pick it up. I know for some it has become somewhat of an inconvenience as we try to uh, get in all the right places and so forth. But I trust this will be a blessing to you. I want to read a song to you uh, that uh, we, uh, I think is a great song in this day and time that we live in. And I wanted to read to you, you know it very, very well, uh, God will take care of you. And the, the words go, be not dismayed, whate'er betide. God will take care of you. Beneath his wings of love abide, God will take care of you. Through days of toil when heart doth fail, God will take care of you. When dangers fierce your path assail, God will take care of you. All you, need, all you may need, he will provide, God will take care of you. Nothing you ask will be denied, God will take care of you. No matter what may be the test, God will take care of you. A lean that weary one upon his breast, God will take care of you. Now the chorus, as we would sing in between the verses, the chorus goes, God will take care of you through every day or all the way. He will take care of you. God will take care of you. We believe that, and those are really great words of comfort. We believe the Lord will take care of us. Uh, during the day today, we've been out a bit, uh, hitting a few homes and dropping these off to folks that have requested the April devotional guide, which begins today. And uh, some we, uh, we know that you enjoy it and we left it at your home, whether you requested it or not. If you did not get one and you want one, certainly just reach the church, leave a message, and uh, we will drive by your house and leave it in your door or something of that sort, uh, or uh, under your mailbox if you have a place where uh, you can stick things other than mail. So we have these for you. I want you to get into the Word of God and enjoy those things. And I appreciate so much your great interest in that. Also, I want to read to you a couple of missionary letters tonight uh, before we get into the uh, message and so forth. But I want to also remind you uh, that to try to stay at doing whatever you can for the Lord Jesus Christ. I know in times like this, folks can be a witness for the Lord Jesus Christ. And maybe uh, via the phone. Uh, Facebook, texting, whatever we're doing, we can certainly still continue to be a witness for the Lord Jesus Christ in these days. And I would ask you to do that. Maybe uh, contact some folks and just give them a kind word, uh, encourage them along the way as they go through that. This is a very difficult period of time for people who may be experiencing loneliness, uh, those who may uh, be experiencing uh, the, the possibility of, of worries or threats and things of that sort. As we're constantly getting bombarded with news cycles and with, with new news, you know, news of, of uh, plants uh, closing for the entire month or news of uh, uh, this situation or that situation. As a matter of fact, uh, being notified by the president that uh, there'll be a spike in death. It's so tragic, so frightening. But yet, uh, for some, they'll never experience any of this. And uh, the fact of the matter is that uh, that is the great enemy we face, and thank God for Jesus Christ. As Paul said at the end of uh, 1 Corinthians 15, uh, speaking of these things, uh, that uh, in Jesus Christ we have triumph. He mentions it also when he's writing in Romans chapter 7, at the end of chapter 7, as he goes through that dialogue of how difficult things are for us, and what it's like to, to battle this old flesh, and to try to live for the Lord Jesus Christ. He said, the things I want to do, I can't. The things that I don't, I end up doing. And he makes that uh, uh, summation there of the uh, wretched man, the man that is in this body uh, dealing with these daily issues and trying to get out of the flesh and walk in the Spirit. And he says, but he, he gave thanks to Jesus Christ, whom we triumph in. So those are great verses if you read uh, just the last verses of 1 Corinthians 15. And the last verses of Romans chapter 7. And so maybe sometimes as you are sitting there, just a nice little text, maybe that phone call, maybe Facebooking with somebody, 
And you encourage them and remind them of the great God that we have and that God will take care of you. And we believe that. And I'm so thankful for this. As, as a nation, we are focusing on this sickness, on this disease, on this horror that we're going through. Uh, but even if it were all, if they came out tomorrow and said, all gone, all done away with, we've come to the cure, and we've healed everything. The fact is, we'd have to deal with death every day. People die every day. It's important that a man wants to die. And in this life, uh, we know one thing for sure, that this body is not meant to live eternally. It will pass, but the great thing for us is that we don't die. We go to be with the Lord Jesus Christ. And I may in the coming days talk about that, some things that uh, we receive by the triumph of Jesus Christ. But I'm so thankful tonight that I'm speaking to a crowd of people who don't believe that Jesus Christ conquered death. And even though we got past this serious uh, infection that's taking place, this horrible situation that we're in, it would not end the fact that people are still dying, that people are still going to have to attend funeral homes and go to hospitals and things of that sort. And they will always, even if this epidemic and pandemic ends, they will still need to hear the message of Jesus Christ and his triumph over death because without them, uh, then uh, they will face death alone. It will be a horrible thing. But with Jesus Christ, you can triumph over the grave. And uh, that's a wonderful truth that we want to share with people. So reminding people, because even as I said, if all of this ends tomorrow and uh, we were given great news, uh, there would still be funerals, graveyards, until Jesus Christ comes and puts an end to all of this. And so I, I trust that you'll continue your ministry of encouragement, your ministry of help, your ministry of praise, and uh, get a hold of folks and encourage them. But I also want to remind you, let's not forget, uh, just because we're uh, not in the church services meeting uh, in this building and in this place, that uh, we still have our obligations before the Lord Jesus Christ to worship Him, to praise Him, uh, to uh, give our tithes and offerings unto the Lord Jesus Christ, uh, to be the witness that Jesus Christ needs us to be, to be the prayer warriors that we need to be. Uh, we're, we have more time now than maybe we've ever had in our lives. We've been so busy and preoccupied with uh, our jobs and with our work with our families and uh, with our pleasure time and all of our responsibilities that allow us to be out of the house and to continue such a life that keeps us busy uh, so much of the day. But now many of us are finding more time at home and I would advise you, don't spend it all uh, internet surfing, don't spend it all uh, chasing this or chasing that. Spend some time uh, maybe developing a longer prayer life and praying more for things that need prayer like our country and like our leaders and like our homes and our families, that God would intervene in such a wonderful way. That at some point, people would quit looking to their government for all of their supply and all of their hope and all of their answers, and they would find Jesus Christ. He's greater than anything they'll ever have, and I want to encourage you to do that. Also, I want to do a little shout-out real quickly to Mary Lawless as she is celebrating her birthday today and trust that she has went home to a wonderful home-cooked meal. Uh, I'm sure that the family has just lavished her today and uh, met their responsibility on this, her birthday. And uh, we give you a little shout out, Mary, and trust you're having a great, great birthday today. I want to read some letters to you uh, from our uh, missionaries. Uh, here is one from Brother Deason uh, in uh, North Dakota, ministering to the uh, folks that are Indians there. And he says here, now this letter came to us uh, somewhere toward the end of... Uh, February the very first of March uh, is when he sent the letter out. So it's our most recent letter from him. He quotes Psalm 46:10, which is it? Uh, maybe at the time you're writing this letter, this epidemic wasn't so bad. But what a great verse! Be still and know that I am God. Uh, Psalm 46:10. I will be exalted among the heathen. I'll be exalted in the earth. He goes on to say, "Warm greetings from North Dakota. Winter is far from over here on the prairie." Uh, with temperatures still dipping well below zero and snow covering the ground. Yet we thank the Lord for the warmth and the sunshine and the mild breezes in the place of the blustery winds we usually have. We know winter will stubbornly hang on for a few more months, but the hope of spring is already in the air. Our new year, our new year has been busy and full of goodness uh, of, of the goodness of the Lord. The Lord has blessed us with good weather enabling us to have services every week this winter, something we are not always able to enjoy. 
On January 12th, we observed our first anniversary of, of pastoring the McLaughlin Church. God has been so gracious to us, meeting with us in our services and speaking to our hearts. We thank the Lord for the visitors we have brought, uh, He has brought to us over the last year. Even in the last few months, we've been given the privilege of ministering to a Filipino teacher that has come to the McLaughlin to teach in the public school. This is her first time away from her home and family in the Philippines. And as a believer in Christ, we enjoy sweet fellowship together. What a blessing that we can share our sweet Lord together, even though we are from completely different parts of the world. And we certainly want to be praying for her as she is a long ways from home at this time. And one of her first experiences, and now to be put in this uh, pandemic, we'll pray for that lady's uh, great encouragement and strength and uh, uh, that her continuance and resolve would be there. He goes on to say the Lord has also continued to give opportunities to speak for him and to minister for him in Selfridge. I've been able to consistently witness and to speak truth to one man in particular. Last Wednesday evening, he came to church sincerely seeking salvation. We had very frank and honest conversations together, and he knows he is not saved and that he has not trusted Christ. Yet on Wednesday evening, he expressed his desire to be saved and have Christ for his Savior. Please pray that we, he will understand the gospel fully and see that only Christ can save him. Just recently, another man who had worked with me last summer has moved back into town and is again working with me on a daily basis. Sometimes I'm amazed at the opportunities God gives me throughout the working day to speak to him and to point this man to Christ. Pray for me as I live my life before him each day that he will not only hear me speak for Christ, but will also see Christ in me. Thank you for your continued prayers for our family and your faithful support. The gifts and cards that were given over the holidays were a blessing. We thank you for them. It is a blessing to be reminded that we are thought of and prayed for, and that we are facing uh, that we are not facing our enemy in this place alone. We truly covet your prayers. It seems that the enemy is seeking to wear out the saints of God in every place, including here. Our biggest request would be that you would hold our family up in prayer every time you think of us. May the Lord find us faithful. I have another letter here from uh, Brother John. He, uh, for a good number of years, was a missionary in West Africa. And due to some health and so forth, they have uh, become missionary replacements. They go to various fields and replace missionaries who are on furlough but don't yet have somebody in the church that can continue the work of God. And so they oftentimes go to different parts of the world and spend several months there filling in those positions until that missionary can return from his furlough. We think that's a very biblical thing. Uh, the, the Bible tells us that uh, the Holy Spirit gathered the church together in Acts 13 and separated men, called them out, and the church sent those men out. And later we, re we read where they came back and reported to the church. So the church sent them out. The church sustain, sustained them uh, in their journeys around the world. And then they came back to get a report of the works that had begun, and the people had been saved as a result of their good work. We practice that here at Faith Baptist Church. Uh, we send out missionaries. We support them and sustain them while they're on the field. Then we expect for them to come back and give report of the work that they've done on that field and then return back to that field with our support and our sustaining. It's a wonderful thing. So here is Brother uh, Jung's letter from March. It is our habit to go out weekly and witness and pass out tracts in town. The marketplace is a great target area because it is a commercial hub. And so many people pass through there. Many people rely on uh, public transit. So folks often have, have waiting time, which allows for conversation. There have been a number who have responded and bowed their heads to, in prayer to ask Christ to be their Savior during this time. That's great. We praise the good Lord for that. Twice we have had the, surprise, the surprising blessing of having people come to our door and to seek help that can only be found in Christ. One man came after his wife accepted Christ one day while my wife and I were out witnessing. She, like Andrew, who brought Peter, called and asked if she could bring her husband we, of course, welcomed them into our home, prepared a meal, and spent a great deal of time listening before we shared the way, the truth, and the life. He professed uh, Christ. 
And he and his wife were in church the next Sunday. He says, what a blessing. Please pray for these two as they work through much baggage from their past. Pray for them to remain in church and to grow in grace. The second opportunity that knocked on our door happened late in the evening last month. Right next to where we are living, there is construction going on. A number of our times, we have supplied cool bottled waters for the workers at that building site. Once, my wife sent muffins during their break. We invited them to our Christmas Eve candlelight service, and two men came. Not long after that, one young man uh, sought counsel over family matters. Since the beginning of wisdom is the fear of the Lord, the first order of business was to in introduce him to Christ. He bowed his head and called on the name of the Lord. Please pray for him uh, we'll, that he will continue to grow in grace. Our days in Fiji are coming to a close as it is nearing time for the missionaries to return to their work and the young church here. During this time, we have seen a lot of spiritual growth in the members. We thank God for the joy of walking along beside men and women as they seek to apply God's word to the, to the daily grind of life. A marriage was renewed in Christ. Several young men sent off for further education. Several victories were won as men faced challenges and maintained strong testimonies in the workplace. We share the burden in presence and prayer with family facing court decisions over child custody. It was a blessing to work with the youth and to see a young lady teach other young ladies in the form of Bible study for the first time and see the youth work together to serve in the Lord in music. While only eternity will reveal the full extent of the fruit of our partnerships in ministry, the Lord of the Harvest has allowed us to see and to be encouraged with both new life and growth. And so this is another wonderful letter from the Jungs, and I appreciate uh, their information. Now, I want to also remind you, you know, oftentimes on Wednesday night we receive an offering for church planting and to help in, in this great work. And I want to challenge you and remind you uh, that as this time seems to extend itself, and I feel even at this point that I have no other choice but to say, uh, at least from week to week, uh, we don't know when services will be allowed back on the premises. So many of you have been faithful to get your tithes and offerings to the church through mail or bringing them by to us. And I want you to know it's greatly appreciated and helps. And it is obedience to the Lord. And I pray that uh, if you need uh, them to be delivered to the church, that you let somebody do that or have us come by or whatever. Uh, but that's not the main thing. The main thing is to make sure that you continue your service to Jesus Christ. And that you continue to pray, read your Bible, and to uh, uh, continue to grow your faith uh, in the Lord Jesus Christ. We don't know how long this will go, but it seems like that as they talk about it, it's going to spike higher and higher. Many, many people are going to go out into eternity. And uh, in these instances, some of these, someone could call and say, Pastor, I have a friend that's in the hospital. I have a family member that's in the hospital. They're sick. And uh, you, would you go visit them? And in the past, we could go visit them. But this is a time where the hospitals uh, don't want and certainly don't need us in and out and uh, spreading and causing a, a greater uh, hurt to other people and bringing harm to people. So many of these people are in hospitals where they may only get a witness maybe if there's a believing doctor or nurse. But not many pastors are may be able to go in now and talk to someone who is in this condition and could die, could go out into eternity. And whereas before, we could go to a hospital bed and witness to them and share Jesus Christ with them. Now, many of them are entering eternity without that final push, without that final help, without that final compassion that could win them to Jesus Christ. These are truly horrible times, uh, very, very frightening times. And so I want you to pray. Because maybe this is the time that maybe somebody in your family that hasn't listened in the past, that you could maybe say that to them. What if you land in the hospital and you know that this thing could take you into eternity, but we can't send the pastor now? And so maybe this is a time that, as we have seen oftentimes great services, revivals, or Christmas meetings, or Easter, to be able to get people to come to church, maybe... Maybe just now this is a time somebody might would listen, sick or not, 
about your plea for their eternity. So I challenge you to do that. I want to read tonight from the book of Matthew in chapter number 15. In Matthew in chapter number 15, I want to talk to you about my subject tonight is three things the Lord likes to hear. Very, very famous story about the Syrophoenician woman in Matthew chapter 15. Uh, a woman that uh, we'll see in the reading of the story uh, was uh, not the focus of the message yet. Uh, the Lord was certainly ministering to the Jews at this time. And he brings that point out as I'll read it. You'll hear me bring that point out as to what he says to her. But here's the great thing about this. If I don't say much more about this through the entire message tonight, here's the great thing about this. Her faith changed the entire situation. He speaks to her and says, uh, it's not me to give the dogs or to give uh, the bread to the dogs and so forth. And he makes these statements to her. She said, but the dogs get to eat the crumbs. And the Lord was so moved by her faith. And that's what always moves the Lord. That's what saves us. For by grace we saved through faith. So when I say these things to you, I'm telling you, here's a lady that maybe was not the focal point of the message, certainly was not being reached out to at this stage, but had seen all that was going on, understood what was going on, and knew that her daughter in great need had no other hope in this world. The government of her land, uh, the uh, people of her land, the money of her land, uh, the treasures of her land, all the doctors of her land, nobody in her land could give her the answer. But our Savior could. And so in his reply to her, she burst right past all of that. And that's what faith does. Faith causes us to burst or to blow past all the obstacles. Causes us to go through all the mountains. Causes us to go through all the valleys. Causes us to wade through all the oceans. To get God's help. And God loves it when he sees faith. And in this instance, when God sees faith, what a great miracle that takes place in the healing of this woman's situation. But I want you to tell you it was faith that carried her there. It was faith that gave her the answer. And it was faith that moved our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And I'm telling you tonight, it's faith, faith, that will get us through this hour, through this situation. And once we get past all of this, it'll get us through every other crisis we ever face. It'll get us through everything, all the way to the end. And it'll get us to heaven with our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ as we practice our faith. And so this is not the last time that we'll ever have to use our faith. It's not the last time we'll have to have to share and, and go to the Lord with great faith. But I want you to understand, when we take our faith to the Lord Jesus Christ, it stops and gets something done. It stops our Savior. It moves our Savior to us. And it causes our Savior to move mountains, to clear oceans, and to fix the need. I'm excited about that already. I, I have a message here to preach, but I feel like just about preaching on that for the next 15 or 20 minutes and call it a night. I'm talking about faith in Jesus Christ and all that it does and what it gets accomplished and how God is moved by our faith and how our faith breaks apart mountains and parts oceans. And I'm thankful for that. And in this instance, heals these people. Now listen to the reading of the great Word of God, Matthew chapter 15. And as I read verse 21 through verse 28, then Jesus went thence and departed into the coast of Tyre and Sidon. And behold, a woman of Canaan came out of the same coast and cried unto him, saying, Have mercy on me, O Lord, thou son of David. My daughter is grievously vexed with the devil. But he answered her not a word. And his disciples came and besought him, saying, Send her away, for she crieth after us. Now there's already a lot right there that you've got to get past. A lot right there you've got to get over. Uh, I don't know for you, maybe uh, it's taken a lot less to upset people. A lot less has turned people from the church. Uh, they may not have liked a, a snotty Christian or a snooty Christian or a snobbish Christian, and they might use that as their excuse. And this woman could have said, well, I don't like his disciples, and I don't like his silence, and I don't like his attitude. And she could have turned and walked away and put all the blame on everyone else. And she didn't let these things stop her. Now notice as we continue the story, but he answered and said, I am not sent, but unto the lost sheep of the house of Israel. And then, she, then came she and worshipped him, saying, Lord, help me. But he, answered, but he answered and said, It is not me to take the children's bread and cast it to the dogs. And she said, Truth, Lord, 
Yet the dogs eat of the crumbs which fall from their master's tables. Then Jesus answered and said unto her, O woman, great is thy faith, be it unto thee even as thou wilt. And her daughter was made whole from that very hour. Well, this tremendous faith. This lady uh, didn't let the distance of her country hinder her from coming to Christ. She didn't let the demeanor of the disciples, the denial of Jesus to her voice. She didn't let any of that stop her. That's the, that's the thing about faith. Faith doesn't have a quitting place. Faith doesn't stop. Many times folks stop in their prayers because uh, their faith has waned. Because their faith is a struggle. The faith that keeps going perseveres. Faith that keeps going gets its promises. And that's what this woman did. She didn't let anything stop her from experiencing the great uh, revenues of faith. And I want to preach tonight for a few moments to you, if I could, on the subject of th three things the Lord likes to hear. And uh, this great story of, to me, it's a great story of missions. And it oftentimes has stirred my heart as a child of God and stirred my heart toward the Lord Jesus Christ because uh, this lady is uh, the, the kind of people that the Lord told us uh, to go to the other most. That when our ministry begins at Jerusalem, then to Judea, and then the uttermost parts of the earth, she would be in the uttermost parts of the earth. She was neither from Jerusalem nor Judea. And uh, yet the gospel is going out. She's hearing about what's happening to people who are receiving the gospel what's happening to people that are getting saved. And so she comes. And so this is a story of missions as those who are beyond the coast of Israel are trying to get in on the message, receive the blessings, and receive the Lord Jesus Christ. And she lets nothing stop her. So she uh, trailed him crying out. Now I want to tell you tonight, I believe that God has sensitive ears. And I believe that uh, our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ has sympathetic ears. And when you cry out, I believe the Lord hears you. And I believe that the Lord was hearing her. And so he hears her cries of hopelessness, her cries of helplessness. He speaks concerning the Jew first principle, uh, yet she pleads, Lord, help me. Forget that principle for just a moment. Uh, don't worry about uh, the season or time it is. Lord, just help me. And I'd say the same thing. We don't know how long this thing may go on. We don't know how long it's intended to go on, but it's not going to stop me from crying out to God Almighty and say, Lord, help us. Please help us. Uh, we're hopeless right now. We're helpless. Uh, government cannot move as quick as you can. Government cannot do what you can do. And I'd ask you, Lord, God in heaven, just to say the words, behold, be healed. And uh, all the research could not uh, uh, act as quick as those words. And I pray you'd do that for our nation and our continent and our world. Lord, please heal and give us a chance to continue to witness to those that are lost uh, before this deadly and horrible thing takes them into eternity. I'm asking for a space of time and a granting of time to those who are inflicted by this and asking God. And all I have to ask by and to come to God with is my faith. I'm glad to do that. And so this woman came with her faith. The Lord answers again. He says, I can't give that which belongs to another. Yet she in astounding faith says, but dogs are worthy of the crumbs. I often think of missions when I read this and I ask, aren't people really worth the crumbs? I remember some years ago, I don't mean to turn this into a long sermon. And I don't even mean to be paying attention to the clock, but I, I just want to share some things with you because it's events in my life. Because I can remember some 20 years or so ago, uh, in my life, if I pulled up to a gas station and got gas, I invariably always went into the store and bought myself a Coke and uh, had it in the car and went out on my visitation or out on the duties and would drink a Coke while I was going along. And I remember when the old Cokes got up to about 99 cents and it took with tax a little more than a dollar to pay for it. And I thought, this is ridiculous. You can go into the store and buy a two liter for 75 cents and you get a little old uh, half liter for uh, 99 cents and with tax is a dollar nine and I said to myself, that's ridiculous. Uh, sometimes didn't drink the whole Coke or didn't drink the whole coffee. I remember when I moved to this place and uh, somebody said, uh, uh, you gonna, let's go to Starbucks. And old Mark, brother Mark said, three bucks? Uh, that was 13 years ago. No telling how much a cup of coffee costs today. And sometimes we leave the bottle half drunk. Sometimes we leave the coffee half drunk. 
and uh, cast it to the side. And I just decided one day in my life, I wasn't going to do that. Every time I went to a gas station, I wasn't going to buy a Coke any longer. And if I went to the gas station three times that week, I'd just give $3 more to missions. And I began to cut Cokes out of my life, uh, at the gas stations at least, and said, I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to go and uh, spend that. I'll just start giving three extra dollars to missions a week. So then I'd start giving uh, $12 to missions every week because I really felt like uh, it would be better to give that uh, to the, uh, of the world in areas of missions. Now, I'd already given my tithes, I'd already given my offerings, I've already given my missions, but I thought, can't they have some more crumbs? Can I not give a little bit more? Can I not keep a missionary or more missionaries on the field uh, sharing the gospel rather than putting those Coca-Colas into my system? And so uh, I began to give those crumbs to missions. And whenever I read this story, I think of all those things in my life that uh, I let maybe unnecessarily or uh, 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 just foolishly or uh, frivolously, I just toss it to the ground and think, well, that could have been used to maybe reach somebody with the gospel. And so maybe somebody has this full loaf of bread, crumbs fall on the ground. She said, at least dogs get that. What great faith. Even the crumbs can save. Even the crumbs can meet the need. I, Lord, I don't need a whole loaf. I don't need a whole slice. I just need your crumbs. And she believed that'd be enough to heal their daughter. Oh, what great, great faith. Sometimes we can't hardly do anything. We don't think we have a full, maybe orchestra to do it, or we don't have a full uh, house to do it, or we don't have the full tools at our resources, or we don't have uh, cathedrals to work out of. And even in this day of mega churches where folks want to be in the mega church scene and uh, little churches may not can compete with their theatrics and their shows and so forth. And uh, sometimes we think we can't do it. But I want to remind you, God can take crumbs. And if that's what I am, I want God to use me to see people saved. And if that's what I give, I want God to use that to get people saved. And so I asked the Lord to use my crumbs. Well, this woman was a woman of Canaan, a Grecian of, of Phoenicia in Syria. She was a person in need and she cried out to the Lord. And uh, that's what the Lord loves. He loves to hear people cry out. So I want to preach to you tonight three things, the, the three uh, uh, things the Lord loves to hear. The first one is the Lord loves to hear us say, Lord, help me. He loves us to say that. I've written several scriptures out rather than turn to them tonight, rather than take the time to wait for you at home to turn them. I've written them out so that I could just read the verses to you tonight. But she cried out, Lord, help me. I think of that time Zacchaeus was going uh, out to meet Jesus. And when he got there, the crowd was huge and people were everywhere. And uh, he couldn't see uh, there was such a press and such a crowd. He was of little stature. He couldn't see. So he climbed a sycamore tree. And the Lord saw him come by and said, Of all the people that they were pressing, some were there just to observe. Some were there just to watch. Some were there maybe to mock. Some were there because they really had a need. But nobody showed more desire than a man that would climb a tree and say, I'm not going to let the disadvantage of my height, I'm not going to let the giants around me stop me from getting to Jesus Christ. So he climbed that sycamore tree. Whether he said it or not, he was saying, Lord, help me. And the Lord said, you come out of that tree. I'm going to your house tonight. We're having supper together. And they went and, man, this guy got so saved. How do you know that? Well, he repented. He began to repent and restore. He said, my stars, I have, I have stolen from men. And anybody that I've stolen from, I'll, re I'll restore many fold. I, what a great story of repentance. Salvation came to that home. But because he is a man of faith, he could have said, many of us might have said, well, I can't get close enough. Crowd's too big. Not my turn, not my day. But he climbed a tree and uh, said, I'm not going to let anything get in the way. I think of old blind Bartimaeus. Jesus is leaving Jericho. He's on his way out of Jericho and uh, heading uh, uh, to another area. And uh, the, the noise and the ruckus causes old blind man sitting on the highway begging uh, for uh, any kind of help. I said, what's going on? I said, Jesus is passing by. He began to cry out, Jesus, thou son of David. Jesus, have mercy on me. And he's crying out for help. And they began to say, be quiet. They began to, to calm him down, to not to disturb. He's got a lot to do. He's got places to be, things to do. But he cried out the more, the Bible says. And I'm telling you tonight, God loves to hear us cry out. He loves to hear the words, Lord, Help me. And that's what 
both Zacchaeus and uh, Bar Barnabas were saying. Psalm chapter 12, verse 1 says, the psalmist said, Help, Lord, for the godly man ceaseth. We're in a mess, he said in Psalm 12. We're in a mess. Help us. And that's what we ought to be saying. Uh, uh, the throne of God, which is a throne of grace, ought to be inundated tonight and the rest of our time with, Lord, help us. The Lord loves to hear those words, Lord, help me. Peter was on the water. We know the story well. We preached it often, just preached it recently. Stepped out of that boat, began to go to the Lord. Stepped out of that boat when the wind was boisterous, when the wind was powerful, when the wind was strong. He didn't get out when everything was calm, uh, but, but he got out. And uh, it was a little bit too much for him after he got out in it. He found out it was bigger than he thought it was. And it was tougher than he thought it was and harder than he thought it was and more frightening than he thought it was. And he said, Lord, save me. The Lord reached out and saved him. See, the Lord loves to hear the words, help me. There's a battle taking place in the life of King Asa uh, in the, the writings of 2 Chronicles chapter 14. And Asa's in this situation and he cried out unto the Lord, his God, and said, Lord, it is nothing with thee. It's nothing with thee to help whether with many or with them that have no power. He said, help us, O Lord our God, for we rest in thee. Isn't this great, great stuff from the word of God? And in thy name, he says, now watch what he says. Asa said, and in thy name, we go against the multitude. <laughs> uh, uh, it doesn't take long for me to tell you that uh, whether it be an army, whether it be a disease, whether it be destitution, whether it be loneliness, it doesn't matter what it is. It's always a multitude against us. It's always bigger than us. It's always stronger than us. But we have something they don't help. We have God's help. They don't have sometimes the things we have. If you're a believer in Jesus Christ, you know what I'm saying. And so he said, help us, Lord. And God loves to help. Jehoshaphat, uh, in 2 Chronicles 18, this a great passage of scripture where uh, uh, Ahab says, Jehoshaphat, let's go get Ramoth Gilead back. The Assyrians had it. We're going to go up against them. And you know in that battle, there's more to it. Micaiah, the 401st prophet and all of that and uh, the situation that led up to it. But they finally get out of battle and Ahab said, well, let, let me disguise myself. You dress like me and I'll disguise myself. But the Syrians said, let's just fight with Ahab. Boy, when they went after Jehoshaphat, uh, thinking he was Ahab, Jehoshaphat began to get very, very scared and worried. All of this is covered in 2 Chronicles chapter 20, verses 3 through 18. But he begins to cry, and he cries out over and over and again and again, verses, four and nine, uh, verses 3, 4, and 9. He fasted, he prayed, he cried in the midst of, the, uh, in the midst of all of this. And then about verse 14, a Levite gets the Spirit and says in verse 17, God's going to help. And I like that. God's going to help. So when you cry out, let me tell you uh, tonight, when you cry out, God loves to help. Can I go further in my message in 2 Chronicles 32, verse 8, the Bible tells us that Hezekiah cries out for help, and God sent an angel. This is where he is fighting Sennacherib. He doesn't have anything to fight with, no ability, no strength. The city is in lockdown like, uh, much like us, but not fear of a disease, but fear of destruction from an army. And uh, he, had, he has no hope. Uh, he has a prophet of God by the name of Isaiah. It goes to him. But when he cried out for help, God sent the death angel by the old Syrian camp and 185,000 are killed uh, in that uh, uh, mysterious battle. He said with him, now here's what Hezekiah said. With him is the arm of flesh. What he's saying is Sennacherib with his 185,000 soldiers. That seems like a lot. So a whole lot of people. Hezekiah didn't have a thousand. He was offered riders. I mean offered horses. And he said I'll give you a thousand horses if you have the riders to sit on them. He didn't even have a thousand people that could ride a horse to battle didn't have any weapons to fight with. Hezekiah acknowledges and he says, with Sennacherib is the arm of the flesh. But listen to these words. But with us is the Lord our God to help us and to fight our battles. God likes to help 
He likes to help those that are weak. He tells the nation of Israel in Isaiah 40, verses 30, 28 through 31, finishing with that verse 31 that we know so famously that we shall mount up with wings as eagles. Tells us not to faint. Tells us not to give in. Tells us not to foil. But that we shall mount up with wings as eagles. Uh, boy, what a great passage of Scripture. If it had not taken so much time already tonight in the message, I'd go read Isaiah 40, 28 through 31 for you. But you read Isaiah 40, verses 28 through 31, and see the God that loves to help when people cry out. He loves to help the weak. He loves to help those who are weak in the fight. He says, don't faint. He loves to help. Hosea chapter 13, verse number 9. Hosea 13, 9. O Israel, thou hast destroyed thyself, but in me is thine help. Christ can help those weak in the faith. Mark chapter 9, verse 24. He can help those that are in unbelief. He can help in following our purpose. In the book of Acts chapter 26, Paul is before Agrippa. And in his witness and testimony of telling him, uh, his events of life and how he came to know the Lord. It says, I was not disobedient to the heavenly vision, verse 19 of chapter 26. But he begins to recount all of his battles and his struggles that the Jews and others had put him through. And here's what he says in chapter 26, 22. When Paul was almost killed, he said, having therefore obtained help of God, I continue unto this day witnessing. I'm telling you, God loves to help people. And I'm going to cry out for his help. Because God not only wants to help people who are weak in the faith, people who are, are, are weak and fainting, He likes to help those to fulfill their purpose. So Paul said, God, help me. And then help in perplexing times. In Hebrews chapter 4, verse 16, our wonderful Lord said to you and I, let us therefore come boldly under the throne of grace that, me, that we may, re, may obtain mercy and find grace and uh, grace to help in the time of need. Now you hear that again? Help. Again, that word shows up. Come to the throne of grace. You'll get mercy. Uh, you'll, you'll have grace to help in the time of need. Now, I don't, I've already taken so long on this and I have quite a bit more to say. I've got to start chopping it off and getting going quick. Here, I'm not even in church in a regular service. You can turn me off and turn me on as you please. Come back and listen when you want. And I feel the pressure of time. I don't want that to get in my way. I want you to know there's grace for every situation. And you've heard me say it many a time. There's saving grace. There's serving grace. There's giving grace. And I can talk to you about so many things. And even when it comes time to go be the Lord Jesus Christ, there's uh, grace, there's dying grace that is given to a believer. And you see it in Stephen's life as he's piled up with those stones, looking up to heaven, and seeing Jesus on the right hand of the Father and uh, commending his spirit. And in going up to be with the Lord, there's dying grace. And I love the grace of God. Here he says in Hebrews 4, 16, grace to help in the time of need. God wants to help you and I. He loves to hear that. I want you to know there's help over fear. There's a lot of fear right now running around. But in Hebrews 13, 6, he says this, so that we may boldly say, the Lord is my helper and I will not fear. I love that. Isn't that great? Great passages from the Word of God. He said, now I want to give you the rest of that verse. He said, the Lord is my helper and I will not fear what man shall do unto me. Not worry about it. Not worry about what they're going to do unto me. And so God wants to help us. Uh, help is a word God is moved by. And uh, we, are, we are to be motivated by the need. Here's what he says in Psalm 33. Our soul waiteth for the Lord. He is our help and our shield. Psalm 33, 20. Psalm 46, 1. God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. God loves, I'm simply telling you that, God loves to help. He loves those that say, Lord, help us. I'll give you a second one. Another phrase the Lord loves is, send me. Send me. Jesus said, I am sent. Matthew 15, when he gets done with this story, Matthew 15, 33 and 34, he said, I'm sent. I'm sorry, verse, verse 23 and 24 in our story. He said, I've sent to the uh, lost sheep of Israel. And so the Lord was a sent one. Great missionary, wonderful missionary. Our Lord was a missionary sent from heaven to witness to those who are lost. And I thank God for that. 
Isaiah 6. We know the story very well. Isaiah is in the days of the death of some very godly kings. And he's concerned about the turmoil. He's worried and the Lord appears to him in a vision. Pulls back the curtains of heaven lets him see in. And he sees this conversation after he sees the glory of God. He sees this conversation. Here's this conversation. And in the conversation, the Lord said, Whom shall I send? And, and Isaiah said, Here am I. Send me. And the Lord sent him. The Lord loves to send people. In Mark 3.14, he sent the twelve. God was angry at Moses in, in uh, Exodus 3 for uh, making excuses. God was wanting him to say, Send me. But he was making excuses. And finally, he did say, I'll go. But God wants to hear the word, send me. God is looking for someone to fill the hedge, to make up the gap. In uh, Ezekiel chapter uh, 22, verse 30, God's looking for somebody who's willing to go and to make up the hedge and to fill in the gap. And we ought to be willing to do that. God is looking to send someone, Matthew chapter 9, verse 38. Uh, Luke chapter 10, verse 2. They said uh, in this passage of Scripture, they said, send her away. No, the Lord wants people to go to meet that lady's need. And so the Lord loves for somebody to say, send me. He loves to hear those words. I'm reminded of a great story. God loves someone who loves to be sent. Such was the case of the great missionary J. Hudson Taylor, a missionary to China. Uh, when he uh, came home from one of his furlough trips, uh, his daughter uh, was very, very, she could see that her dad was very, very sad and her dad was very, very lonely and wanted to get back to his work. So on his birthday, his five-year-old daughter made him a gift. She brought him a piece of wood with a peg stuck in the middle of the wood, topped it with a half of a cockle shell. Well, Taylor did not recognize the nature of the gift and did not want to grieve her, so he took her up upon his knees and began to probe her for clues. He's questioning her. What this gift could mean, what is this gift? A peg of wood, or a piece of wood with a peg in it and a half a cockle shell in it. What in the world is this? Finally, his daughter caught on and she just finally, Maria said, well, Daddy, don't you get what it is? She said, don't you know it's a ship? And I thought you would like best for your birthday a ship to take you back to China to preach to the Chinese. Oh, what a great story. God loves. I'm telling you, God loves for someone to say, send me, I'll go. God loves for someone to say that. Can I give you a third one? And then I'll close. This is my third point. The Lord loves to hear somebody say, teach us. He loves for people to be hungry for the Word of God. To be hungry for answered prayers. To want to learn to do spiritual things. So He loves it when someone says, teach me. She said, when the Lord told her this first response, she said, truth, Lord. Truth. Truth, Lord, yet the dogs eat of the crumbs. Verses 27 and 28. In verse 28, Jesus answered her. Because Jesus loves for folks to say, teach us. Uh, the disciples said to our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, teach us to pray. The Lord wants to hear us uh, say, teach us. Job 36, 22. Elijah said, who teacheth like him? The Lord told uh, the crowd in Deuteronomy chapter 4, verse 20, when they would go into the land, uh, he began to teach and talk to the parents about parenthood. And he began to tell the parents in chapter 4, verse number 20, the Lord said, gather me the people together and I will make them hear my words that they may teach their children. The Lord loves for someone to say, teach us. Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 7. Again in chapter 11, verse 19, he says, teach your children. When uh, the nation was in the, the uh, period of the judges, Samson's coming along and uh, the wife, Manoah, Manoah and uh, the parents of Samson get this encounter of this angel. And so, you know the story well. She wanted him to hear the story, so... The angel reappears and they have this conversation. The father so shook up by the conversation said, 
Well, we've seen God. We're going to die now. And the wife settling the situation. Now, ladies, enjoy this. Uh, the reactionary husband. Well, we're going to all die. We're going to die. We've heard from God. We've seen God. We're going to die. She looks over and says, well, he wouldn't have told us what he's going to tell us he's going to do if he's going to kill us. Obviously, if we're dead, we can't do what we're going to do. We're going to give birth to this great judge coming up. And, uh, you know, think a little bit. And she has to kind of scold her husband to have more faith and uh, get grip on the situation. And so uh, they were told about the birth of the child. Well, in the process of it, uh, we find out he's going to be a Nazarite from the birth. And she said, teach us how we should command the child. God loves when parents say, teach us how to teach our children. God loves that. Not only does he say, teach us in that way, but God likes for someone to say, teach us the path. In Psalm 25, verse 4, teach me thy paths. See, the Lord loves it when someone says, teach me. Teach me. Lord, help us. Uh, the Lord, lo Lord, send me. Lord, teach me. God loves that kind of talk. He loves it when we ask to teach us protection. In Job 34, verse, 20, verse 32, That which I see not, teach thou me if I have done iniquity, I will do no more. Isn't that a great passage of Scripture? Teach that. He says, That which I see not, teach thou me. Boy, oh boy, there's a lot of uncertainty. There's just a lot of paths I don't know. Uh, Yogi Berra said one time, you come to the fork in the road, take it. <laughs> Most of us are about that undecided. We don't know which way, which one's the way. The uh, fork in the road can be very confusing, but a man like Jim Elliott would say, uh, when you come to a fork in the road, or he wanted his life to be a fork in the road is what he said, so that when, when people come to him, they would have to choose Christ or not. What a great fork in the road. Many people come to a road, a fork in the road with no direction. But a believer can be a direction. Choose Jesus Christ. So God says, I love it when I hear someone say, teach us. He says, let me give you further, teach us the practical things. Psalm 90 verse 12, the days of life. Teach us to number our days that we may apply our hearts unto wisdom. Teach us about the practical things. He goes on to say in Psalm 94 too, teach us correction and thy law. Isaiah 28 for his God doth instruct him to discretion and doth teach him. God loves it when we say teach us. Teach us our purpose. And this is the last of that teaching part. Teach us our purpose. And they shall teach thy people the difference between the holy and the profane. And cause them to discern between the unclean and the clean. Job 624, teach me, and I will hold my tongue, and cause me to understand wherein I have erred. Psalm 14, verse 10. Teach me, uh, teach me to, or teach me thy will, for thou art my God. Thy spirit is good. Lead me into the land of uprightness. God loves it when we say, teach us. As a matter of fact, that's the Great Commission. Go into all the world and teach. God loves it when we say, Lord, help us. God loves it when we say, Lord, send me. And God loves it when we say, teach us. I'd say it's about time to, for the church to get off the stool of do nothing and get back to calling on a God that wants to be called on. Now, I know many of you are prayer warriors. Now, many of you seek the Lord. And I know many of you follow God and you love Him with all of your heart. You do anything in the world for Jesus. I know that. You're the crowd that I preached to for over a dozen years. You love Jesus. But let's don't forget tonight when we pillow our heads to simply say the sweetest words God loves here. Lord, help us. We can't help ourselves. Help us. If I wait for government, I'm likely to die. And I'm not trying to run government down because God ordained it. But I'm saying... The answer is God Almighty, and I'm going to Him. God, help us. But I'm still saying, Lord, send me. And I'm still saying, glory to God, teach me. I want to learn so much. I thank God for His book.
I pray again tonight that you'd have maybe an invitation right there in your home. Maybe you had in your recliner, chair, couch, by your table, just get out and say, Lord, I want to spend a little time unrehearsed, no paper in front of me, but I want to ask you for some things that I need help with. I need help maybe with my children. I might need help with my job. I might need help with my health. I might need help with my faith. But Lord, please help us. Would you pray with me, Father? Bless our congregation. Let these be times that we exercise the greatest faith we have ever exercised. I pray you'd move in my life and move in theirs. And I'm thankful for God that invites me to come and say, help me. Send me. Teach me. Bless thy word tonight, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless your congregation and good night.